What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and there's some really bizarre things going on right now. From activists demanding the industry purge the fans from the equation entirely, a YouTube channel that's being accused of protecting Sweet Baby Inc. and their game having some connection to the company, and Suicide Squad's latest update is likely going to be the end of that dumpster fire too. To begin, let's look at this article from thatparkplace.com titled, Cornerstone Interactive Studio CEO Lisette Teachery Montgomery claims gaming executives surrender the video game industry to angry racists and sexists. Lisette has worked in the games industry since 2005 in places like Ubisoft and Double Fine to name a few, and they believe that the concept of wokeness has only made profits soar instead of plummet, which is a crazy statement to make given the absolute state of the industry, but that's what she thinks apparently. Lisette said via Twitter, the numbers don't lie, wokeism is just sparkling profits. Beware spineless gaming execs. We are coming for that money you left on the table, surrendering your communities to angry racists and sexists. Their poison is in your soil and you will never get it out. Time for the new era of gaming. Lisette is basically saying that the audience that has become the status quo for decades now, like you and me, or apparently what's wrong with the industry, and not the other way around. We are, according to Lisette, the angry racists and sexists. And we are poison that has infected the fertile soil that is the game's industry. So, according to Lisette, what she's working towards alongside others is to usher in a new era where players like yourself and me are no longer welcome within the industry. The completely out of touch bit is that Lucette comes to this realization after citing an extremely small survey conducted by someone named Khalif Adams, who runs some podcast you've never heard of. Apparently this survey was conducted in 2020, and has a sample size of barely even 2,000 people at best, ranging from the ages of 10 to around 65. According to Lisette and her partners, this very skewed survey where the people asked for input were carefully chosen was obviously devised in order to push an agenda. And of course, if you go around and ask almost 2,000 people who believe in your ideology almost to a T what they think about the industry, of course they will echo what you want to hear. And obviously, a survey of barely 2,000 individuals is not enough data to properly convey what the entire gaming demographic wants. Given that there's around 3 billion people on Earth that play video games regularly and engage with it on a daily basis, saying that 2,000 or less people's opinions speak for the billions is obviously just ridiculous, but they're rolling with it anyway. Another person involved with this bogus survey was Marcus Kennedy, a general manager within Intel. Here's what they said about it, and I quote, the common misconception that all gamers are young, white males could not be further from the truth. Practically everybody engages with games in some way, shape, or form. As gaming continues to grow in popularity, so does its ability to connect people across geographies, generations, and more. However, there are many challenges to overcome when it comes to representation and diversity in gaming. Intel is constantly looking at how to best serve the gaming community. We know that there are huge visibility, technology, and accessibility gaps impacting marginalized and underrepresented communities. In order to address this in real, impactful, and sustainable ways, Intel collaborated with Nuzu to gather relevant and actionable data. Diversity and inclusion efforts are a top priority for Intel, and this report is representative of Intel's desire to better understand its diverse global customer base. As part of that continued commitment, Intel is taking key learnings from this report and shaping current internal and external programs to better serve gamers from all backgrounds and walks of life." End quote. As you can see, these controlled surveys are attempting to shape the narratives surrounding video games and individuals like Lissette and Marcus, and are trying to use these controlled surveys in order to paint the picture they want perceived within the industry at large. It's all bogus lies, of course, and they attempted to further state that half of America doesn't feel properly represented in the media today, when media is more diverse than ever before, which already proves what they're saying is not true and yet another lie made up to fit an agenda. They attempt to say that games that appeal to larger diverse groups are key to increasing incomes and reach, but we also know this is not true either. Since many games that do push said forced diversity pretty much always end up as resounding failures. The Saints Row remake is of course an easy pick, where its core cast is about as diverse as it gets. And yet the game sold poorly, and now Volition is dead, and the IP is floating in nothingness for the foreseeable future. 
Not to mention mistakes like Forspoken or more recent blunders like Suicide Squad, which recently released its Season 1 update with the Joker being a playable character. By the way, that Season 1 release for Suicide Squad is going over about as well as you'd expect. Season 1 has boosted the player counts on Steam over 10 times its normal amount, which may sound impressive, but it's actually still horrible. Cause by 10 times the concurrent player count reached a total high on Steam of around 3,000 players only. Which has already dipped below 1,500 as Season 1 is being called by Forbes Paul Tassi as one of the worst seasonal updates he's ever seen in a live service game. Suicide Squad was also killed by diversity equity index pushes and all its main characters were torn down while propping up all the female ones. Here's what Paul Tassi had to say about Suicide Squad Season 1, which the devs were hyping as being the moment the game would return to its glory, and I quote, While I was not exactly expecting Suicide Squad to kill the Justice League's new Joker season to save the already failed game, I was not expecting it to be one of the worst live service launches I have ever seen. It's a void of content, a mountain of grinding, and a complete lack of a story that was promised to continue after the abrupt ending of the campaign. What went wrong here? Quite literally almost everything. After the first day, in which I have finished essentially everything, here's what happened. You were not given Joker when you log in, unlike when Marvel's Avengers dropped a new character, instead you are told to grind to season rank 35 to fight Brainiac to then unlock him. This is not Battle Pass rank or Mastery rank, but a separate third rank that will force you to grind somewhere between 10 to 20 missions. Depending on the mission to reach that level, this is old content with your old characters, but your difficulty is capped on things like incursions, making them impossibly easy with your already powerful builds. There are no new mission types to launch here. Zero. There was supposed to be something called a stronghold, but it may not launch until halfway through the season, and it's not here now. Instead, the new incursions are either straight up killing enemies, grunts in one, brutes in one, infused enemies in another, and then the anti-aircraft gun mini-mission from the first game. As for Joker story content, there were exactly two things. A motion comic at the season opening showing him being trapped by Brainiac. Then when you rescue him, there is a brief cutscene with him being taken to Argus and recruited. He doesn't even speak to Harley and she just tells Shark she's not into comedians anymore. There is no story mission related to Joker at all. Once you have Joker, it's back to grinding the same stuff again. Nothing new appears, nothing changes, he starts at level 10, and you'll probably have to knock down world difficulty to start leveling him. I thought my mastery ranks were bugged at first, but they only unlock after you get him, so you can start doing those, but again. These new incursions do not have any new objectives. Rock said he said there there were new infused enemies, but I have no idea what they are or if they're even in the game. To summarize, not allowing Joker to be played from moment one was impossibly stupid and feels like a ploy to sell a time skip, which can instantly unlock him. Then, you cannot launch a new season of a live service game with exactly zero new content, both in terms of mission mechanics and story." End quote. So, as you can see, Suicide Squad, which is both a sweet baby creation and considered the sort of game people like Lucette who thinks players like yourself are racist, should be forced to enjoy because it adheres to their controlled, insane principles. And it's also nothing but a terrible game that just got an infusion of even worse content somehow that adds basically no new story, no new content, or anything at all. And this is the sort of experience and future these sorts of weirdos want for every single one of you. Here's a clip of this Joker in Suicide Squad, and uh, you tell me if they nailed this character or not. Here you go. They're all dead. What a tragedy. What a heartbreaker. The sprays of blood, the smell of singed hair, the viscera. Oh, the viscera. I'd definitely do it differently this time around. Cleaner. Well, congratulations, Task Force X. It took you all of 20 seconds to lose control of them. Hey, 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 don't misunderstand me here. I killed my team because I truly cared about them. And even though I've only just gotten to know you guys, I care about you that much too. Colonel Flagg, lock him up. For the record, 
I hate this. Oh, is it too much? Making new friends after a move is always tough. Oh, this is much more accommodating than other cells I've been in. Joker sounds more like some random guy doing a Deadpool impersonation while dressed like a clown than the Joker. Also doesn't help that he's an Elseworlds version since, you know, Arkham City's ending and all that. It's just pathetic how bad Suicide Squad really is and that we lost the Arkham vs. quality and integrity for this nonsense. But I guess it doesn't matter if Suicide Squad is a dumpster fire that doesn't respect your time or money, it should be enough to buy it full price simply because it adheres to the tenets of woke ideologies. This game, in their eyes, is the gold standard of what gaming should be going forward. To not be enjoyed or respectful of your time, but slop that pushes pro-feminist agendas. And a very evident anti-white male narrative since most of the boss fights and villains are of course white straight men. And these crazy people have the audacity to then say that the soil that is the gaming community is poisoned because of your existence. And I find that to just be gaslighting nonsense on their part at best. And in truth, the games that have performed best so far this year anyway have been games that if anything remove stuff like diversity nonsense from their experiences. Stuff like Helldivers 2 just makes you a grunt that's forced to shoot bugs and robots, and Pal World of course has you shooting monsters with guns. Not to mention games like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I finally platinumed recently after 161 hours, is a game that sold and reviewed well because it didn't push any agendas. I'm now playing Rise of the Ronin on PS5, and guess what? It's fun. Besides its insane depth of customization, which is to be expected since it is Team Ninja after all, the game feels like an Assassin's Creed game set in Japan, but so far from what I've played, the game is completely devoid of wokeness. Everything just feels authentic, the story obviously is about ships from the west coming to eastern shores. So you have western technology like guns and then there's weapons like rapiers or greatswords that are available to use alongside your katanas and odachis. It's an interesting mix, but again, none of it talks down to you, so far anyway, I'm not done it of course. But I think if anything, the games that are performing the best are the ones that just give players good gameplay and escapism over the crippling push of politics at every conceivable moment. That same survey that was totally not controlled in every conceivable way to create a narrative they want had more to say, such as, A significant share of gamers in the US feel game companies should take a stance on societal issues. Irrespective of the respondent's race, gender identity, sexual orientation, or having a disability. Sitting on the fence for certain issues may seem like the safer option, but taking an active stance may lead to increased engagement and revenue among the diverse gaming audience. Absolutely everything this bogus survey pushes is insane and completely not true. There is no actual rational thinking gamers out there who want game companies to go out of their way to give their stances on political issues. If anything, what players really want is for these companies to stay out of them more often than not. Because pushing ideologies or saying that you support one thing over another will usually do nothing but splinter and anger the audience. Imagine if a game company or studio put support behind Israel or Palestine. It would do more harm than good ultimately in the end, no matter which way they pivoted. The best option in something as politically charged as that is to not rally support behind either option. Because regardless, you're just going to cause chaos for yourselves when you don't have to. Take for example Bioware recently, which advocated for trans rights on Easter Sunday of all days. This sort of push has done nothing based on its social media response but splintered their fan base. And I think it would have been in Bioware's best interest to maybe just not say anything at all and, oh I don't know, finish a video game for once. Since Bioware hasn't had an actual title come out of their mainline studio since Anthem. So it would be in their best interest to buckle down and get something out the door that reviews well and makes solid profits instead of pandering instead. It's sort of like when you hear some out-of-touch celebrity try to tell you how to live your life, you don't care what they have to say. Just shut up and go make escapism content, you're in no position to lecture the public on anything at all. And I wish everyone from game studios to movies, actors, or whatever else just stop their activism entirely across the board. Because most of it is just empty virtues and it does nothing but split their fan base while doing more harm than good. One Twitter user responded to Lissette and said Saints Row, Forspoken, The Avengers, Suicide Squad, Alan Wake 2, these games have damaged or even killed companies. To which Lissette responded, sure, had nothing to do with bad investments in saturated markets and the rejection of live service models. 
Oh, sweetheart, I know math is hard. What the hell does Saints Row, Forspoken, or Alan Wake 2 have to do with live services? Those games were strictly single-player driven experiences. Sure, Avengers and Squad are live service, or I should say worse since Avengers is already dead, but attempting to mass-summarize all of these as bad investments due to oversaturation is moronic. Since there is no mass saturation when it comes to good games, if the content is great, people will show up for it no matter what. There is not a saturated market for quality, if anything there is a lack of it. And I would argue every game listed there has either below average quality gameplay story and systems throughout them. Of course, Lissette attempts to gaslight the user and say they're idiots, but the user is actually right. These people are so delusional and headstrong when it comes to their politics and ideas being welcomed that they don't realize just how unpopular and nuclear these positions have become. You want to make millions in modern AAA gaming? Make a game that runs well, doesn't nickel and dime users for everything, and doesn't talk down to people and just gives them escapism. Bonus points if it's reasonably priced. I pretty much just explained what Helldivers 2 is, and yeah, that's basically what gaming needs to be. Less political, more escapism. But that's not what these crazy people want. They want escapism to no longer exist, and have every real-world agenda they agree with or push to become prevalent and eternal in today's gaming market. And like I always say, it's within their right to do that, but it's the user's right to reject these policies and ideas as well. Unfortunately, there was this other story where Bellular News, which is a YouTube channel, decided to talk about venture capitals in gaming recently. The video is titled The Venture Capital Threat People Haven't Noticed, and they talk about Kotaku within the video and how that website has been forced by their owners to shift the website's focus from stories to game guides. Which of course caused their editor-in-chief to quit on the spot, and now Alyssa Mercanti, who was responsible for that Sweet Baby article where they omitted critical information, to confirm that she's working on some follow-ups to those for Kotaku, and pretty much the entire website right now is just a mess. Which is no surprise, because this is Kotaku we're talking about. I mean, they've been a mess for over 10 years, and honestly, it's incredible they've managed to stay alive this long. They're like herpes, you just can't get rid of them, but I guess anyway, Bell News talked about them and suspiciously never brought up why Kotaku's website was receiving heat or anything like that. The entire Sweet Baby Inc. story was not mentioned at all, which was weird considering it's easily the biggest story of the year so far. Then fans of Bell News started to swarm the video's comments section asking why were they defending Kotaku? And why they refused to speak about the entire Gamergate 2 situation all month as well. It all seemed very strange that Bell News was omitting important information, the same way Kotaku did when it came to their article about SBI as well. Fans then discovered that Bell News had a game that released last year called The Pale Beyond, which personally, I never heard of it. However, the game was published by a company called Fellow Traveler. You can see here on their website, The Pale Beyond is distinctly mentioned and promoted. And if you go on Sweet Baby's website, Fellow Traveler is listed in their partners at the very bottom right of their webpage. Bell News did respond to these allegations to which they said, They had zero involvement with us and I didn't know they existed until very recently. I just didn't think that had part to play in the VC media story. So Bell News' Mike says they have no involvement with SBI, even though their game is published by a company that is aligned with SBI. Of course, this does not mean they are aligned per se, since Square Enix of course has been aligned with SBI before, but it doesn't mean that every game they've made is connected to SBI. Since Final Fantasy XVI exists, and there's no way in hell SBI is involved with that game for very obvious reasons. But of course, if you go on Fellow Traveler's YouTube page, you can find a fireside chat between Kim Belair, the co-founder of SBI, and Fellow Traveler right there to watch and listen to. Of course, the comments are turned off because what else is new, but while Michael of Bell News says he didn't work with them, which I believe him based on the credits of The Pale Beyond, there doesn't seem to be any SBI individuals involved, it's likely the reason why he didn't bring up the SBI controversy in his videos or protects Kotaku. It's because if he spoke out against SBI in any way, it would result in a conflict of interest with the publishing company of the game that he's attached to. Which is a little weird, suspicious too, so to put it plainly, as of now anyway, did Bell News work with SBI and the Pill Beyond? As of right now, it seems unlikely. But making a whole video about venture capitals and bringing up Kotaku and then not speaking on how their website imploded due to the SBI backlash? That was obviously done deliberately on Bell News' part, I would say. 
But I do think given the fact that Bell News' entire reason for existing is to report on what's going on in video games, and then not mention once about SBI and that whole thing is very deliberately done on their part. And it echoes the whole niche gamer story where they couldn't report on the Elon Musk story about white men being excluded in video games and the whole black girl gamers thing, because they would lose access to game codes and relationships that are integral to the operations of their website. But in Niche Gamer's case, at least, they didn't shy away from the entire conversation and act like they didn't know it was happening. If you do this sort of thing for a living, there is no way in hell you don't know about the Sweet Baby Discourse. Generally, there's no way. It's literally everywhere. But Niche Gamer at least said it plainly in a transparent way as to why they can't cover it. Which may seem like them bending the knee, but honestly, I don't think it is per se because they are playing the corporate Game of Thrones, if you will, and the fact they said why they can't helps their integrity far more than what Bell News is doing here instead. Because Bell News is acting like they somehow don't know about the connection. And when Michael says the SBI connection with Kotaku and the venture capitalist story are not intrinsically connected and therefore doesn't need to be mentioned, I feel like that's disingenuous too. Look, I'm not saying boycott Bellular News or anything, I don't really follow them closely anyway, I've seen their coverage before, and most of it just seems like safe opinions to have for the most part in everything they say and do, which is fine. I mean, if that's what you want to be there for, sure, go ahead. But they're not exactly the first place I would go to if I wanted the most up-to-date information on what's actually happening, especially when they pretty much ignored the biggest story of the year so far by choice. And the game they worked on has to some extent some level of connection to SBI, but ultimately, I wouldn't say boycott them or anything. They're probably just another news channel like a skill up or something that doesn't want to step on any tones if it means it loses them offers. I get it, I do, but I think if you're a news channel, you should probably report on the news that's trending since, you know, that's your job. But I think Bell News needs to at least acknowledge that if they are a channel ran on trust and transparency, go the niche gamer route and explain at least why you can't speak on said topics. It might disappoint people, but the honesty will go a long way regardless. But I do find it disingenuous and annoying whenever someone refuses to speak on something because they feel as if it'll lose them opportunities. But that just tells you the state of the industry we all live in today. You can criticize people, I guess, as long as it's okay to do so, like Blizzard for example, they're a safe bet, which Bell News dunks on almost constantly given their track record. But when it comes to actual news that really matters, it's the usual sidestepping. It reminds me of the act man when he suddenly started to care about Sweet Baby once it became popular to do so earlier in March, but wouldn't dare speak about it prior to because of course it wasn't mainstream to do so. I never liked this sort of stuff and it echoes from the concept of wrong think versus right think. Like those crazy people in the beginning, like Lisette and Marcus, everything is manufactured and designed to fit certain ideologies and agendas and it just sucks more than anything. Games aren't failing because they aren't diverse enough, even though that's what these crazy people want to think. If anything, they're failing because things like diversity seem to matter more than literally anything else they put in video games. Your game keeps kicking you out like Suicide Squad did in Early Access? That's okay, I guess. Oh, the game has tired mission designs and terrible player retention. That's fine, too. At least the men are feeble, weak idiots and all the women are girl bosses, I guess. That's what really matters. So sure, you might go bankrupt, but at least you're not racist, I guess. It really does seem like these people think the world runs on thoughts and prayers instead of capitalism or something. Maybe that's another reason why they want to change things as well, but I think if anything, what they're pushing is clearly not working, neither from a societal standpoint or an economic one either. Everybody hates these policies, millions are pushing back, and none of it will likely be the status quo in another 10 years. I would honestly be shocked if woke nonsense still exists in gaming in 10 years. If it does, then the Western industry is cooked as hell, dude. None of it will go over well at all. You already got ballooned budgets, expensive server maintenances, and other insane costs, and now you want to jeopardize all of that and the thin line that is DEI? It makes me worried for many games in the future, but I guess we'll see. When they aren't making up totally fabricated surveys to strengthen their agenda, they also got enough power, I guess, to scare even YouTubers into compliance, it seems. And all of this to push an agenda that gives you worse products for more money that are nowhere near the quality bar they should be aiming for. Gaming is obviously not in a good spot, but I think consumers are smart to reject these things, and by the continued rejection, we can fix these problems sooner than later, I think. Anyway, as always, thank you for watching, subscribe, like, and share the video, and thanks to my patrons as well for their undying support. Have a wonderful day, enjoy some gaming, and I'll see you in the next one.